私は死の淵よりの死者破滅の星土星を守護に持つ沈黙の戦士Makoto Kino. I am Sailor Jupiter. Minako Aino. I am Sailor Venus. Chibi Usa. I am Sailor Chibi Moon. And Mamoru Chiba. Tuxedo Mask. The barrier is failing. You have to act fast, otherwise the enemy is going to invade the Earth. Unfortunately, Usagi is still the only character to receive the bulk of the development, but at least this time around, our other Sailor Guardians get a personality. For example, Rei is back to being mean towards Usagi like the original anime did. I knew you'd be the last one to get here. Pigs will fly before Usagi's on time. That's mean, Rei! Oh, thank the gods for that. She's no longer one-dimensional. She's moved up to 1.5D. We finally learn that Minako dreams to be an idol while Makoto wants to grow plants. I also love Makoto's new attack name. Jupiter! Coconut! Cyclones! Manako also reveals in one episode that she too has her own compact that lets her disguise herself in the same manner Usagi does. Back to Usagi, she utilizes her newest form she received at the end of the previous season thanks to the Cosmic Heart Compact and Spiral Moon Rock. Oh no, not again! <laughs> Halfway through the season, she acquires the Holy Grail that allows her to transform into Super Sailor Moon, which is once again my favorite iteration of the character from a design perspective. Beyond this, there's not too much to add to her character as she is the same ditz as always, just less whiny about it and takes situations much more seriously than before. Chibi Usa continues her quest to become a top-notch Sailor Guardian, she too receives her own rod, though it's pretty much useless against her adversaries who clearly outrank her. While we do get to meet a few of Chibi Usa's classmates, the majority of her development comes from her friendship with an estranged girl named Hotaru Tomoe. I am an emissary from the Abyss of Death, protected by Saturn, the outer planet of destruction, the guardian of silence. I am Sailor Saturn. Wow. Aren't you just a little ray of sunshine? Hotaru is quite different to how she was portrayed in Sailor Moon S as she was nearly killed with her mother in a fire that left her on death's door until her dad turned her into a cyborg. Good morning. You're awake. How are you feeling? Any discomfort? <laughs> Ew, that's disgusting! As such, she's quite shy because of her disability and avoids interactions with people at all times. At least until Chibi Usa befriends her. After that, she starts to find value in herself. Of course, all of this seems moot when the show's plot continues to speed through everything as if it were a Jack Rabbit on its wedding night. One thing I do have to say I like about this version of the R compared to S is we get to see more screen time of Hotaru as Sailor Saturn. She has some of the best lines in the show, and the fact that she can destroy everything in one attack is just badass. It seems as though I remain the uninvited guest. So dark! The Ajena from the DC Universe! Other new characters introduced in this season are Haruka Tenno. I am Sailor Uranus. And Mishiru Kayo. I am Sailor Haruka is much more androgynous in the series compared to the original. Are you a man or are you a woman? I'm confused. How should I treat you? <laughs> is my sex that important? Can't you just see me as me? 
Ah, Sailor Moon. Breaking gender norms before it was cool. It's an interesting concept that sadly doesn't seem to have any true purpose behind it other than it got people talking. I wish more had been done with it. But you know, pacing is not Crystal's strong point. Some of the games we play are dangerous. Mishiru is pretty much the same as before, a violinist with attitude problems. My ears are splitting, it's too loud! <laughs> Due to the quick paced, short nature of this arc, they only have a limited amount of screen time in sailor form, which is quite unfortunate as there is never any time to build up some sort of rivalry between them and our regular guardians. In fact, in one episode they tell the guardians they can never be friends because of their separate missions, only for them to rush into danger to rescue them practically five minutes later. Which is why we can't work together, and why we cannot be friends. Sailor Moon is in danger, and we'll force our way through! It just does not make any sense. Another aspect I am not a fan of is they already have their weapons at the start of the season, so they're not something they had to earn from being courageous or anything. We also never get a backstory showing us how the duo met, which is also a disappointment. Their English voices remain the same as they were in the classic series, while Junko Minagawa and Sayaka Ohara portray the duo in the Japanese version. I'm scared to imagine all the repair bills. The windows, plus the damaged furniture. I bet fixing it all will cost a fortune. About the talismans, the three of us know what they do and we've seen them activate. But only just once, a very long time ago. The same goes for Hitaru, who is now voiced by Yukio Fuji in Japanese. The creature that attacked you out in front of the school. I'm sorry about that. I think it might have been one of the test subjects from my father's lab. Oh. Daddy's kind of eccentric. His research and experiments are creepy. <laughs> Sailor Pluto returns this season, taking on the human form of a woman known as Setsuna Mayo. Dead scream. <laughs> She's a college student and is befriended by Matoki's girlfriend, Reika. That's all there really is to her. Usagi's family actually shows up a couple of times this season, while Naru and Umino are relegated to a single scene. Why even bother? The Villains. This season's villains are a group of alien scientific mages known as the Death Busters. Who you gonna call? Death Busters! The Henchwomen are the Witches Five, which is made up of Yudio, Mimet, Vilui, Telu, and Supreme. As with the Spectre Sisters last season, the Witches Five are pretty much their own Monsters of the Week esque characters, for each one is usually dead in the episode they partook in, outside of Supreme, who lasts a little bit longer to show off her clone counterpart. I am Cyprin. And I am Patillo. And together we are one witch. She's split in two. The sad part is they are usually killed in battle in the blink of an eye. No, seriously. I went to write down something in my notebook during the Valui and Ami fight. And I was only looking away for like a second. When I looked up, Valui was already dead. I was like, oh, sh what? What's up? <laughs> They do at least feel like they had some sort of presence compared to the Spectre Sisters, however. Let's begin the official Mugen Academy welcome ceremony. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. Their leader is the Magus known as Keola Knight. Keola Knight was the assistant of Hotaru's father Suichi when they were both greeted by an alien being known as Pharaoh 90, who turned them into his minions to help conquer Earth. Are you okay? What's this light? I feel different. It appears your vesselization was successful. Again, there's not much time to develop Keola Knight, so she comes off as nothing more than the general that is there to die. It's a shame they didn't do much with her. Then again, I can pretty much say that about everyone featured here. As for Suichi himself, compared to S, he is one unredeemable son of a bitch in this show, so you do not feel the least bit sorry for him when the time comes. Pharaoh 90 wants to take over the world because his universe is dying and he needs a new one. While it is nice that we actually get to see him this time around as opposed to what they did in S, it really doesn't matter since he's just a purple ocean of gunk. Hey, at least he ain't a cloud. 
Although he could be. There are kind of monsters of the week in the show, at least for a couple of episodes, that are known as daemons. Just like with Pharaoh 90, they're pretty much purple blobs that look like a spider or in one instant a cat that the Guardians defeat with ease. Nothing at all special about them. Lastly, we have Mistress 9, who kicks her roll off by nearly killing Chibi Usa. <laughs> That act alone makes her badass. What's interesting is she has about the same amount of screen time here that she had in S, and still manages to be the most fleshed out villain of them all. She still holds a huge presence, only this time she gets a couple of additional forms beyond just her human looking one. The animation and music. I have got to hand it to Toei on this one. The animation is a vast improvement over the first two seasons. It also helps that they did away with the dismal CGI and went for a more classic looking style, even for the transformation scenes which are utterly gorgeous this time around. Furthermore, the animation is much more lively looking as character faces will change depending on the mood of the scene, and it's like the animation isn't afraid to show a bit of silliness every now and then. We're all Sailor Guardians. We fight for love and justice, and protect the innocent. Yeah, yeah it's true, but also not true. It's more of a metaphor. <laughs> they really capture Mistress Nine's craziness extremely well, too, with her eyes. Uh, what's happening to me? I'm stuck. I can't move. Or break free. It's not totally free from oddities, as there is a scene where the back of Usagi's head looks very choppy. Regardless, it's what the animation should have been the entire time. I could do without the Flying Sailor Guardians, however. I just don't get the obsession with giving them anti-gravitational abilities. Yasuhara Takanashi remained in charge of the score, which continues to impress. There is a lot of mood involved in his soundtracks, as heard here. Uh, no way. So you're saying... It's her? I love the music to the show. The opening song is New Moon Ni Koi Shite from Tika A. Every few episodes features a different artist singing the opening, and overall, it's an okay opening. I personally prefer the opening from the previous two seasons, as it felt far more energetic than this somber note. <laughs> There's also three different ending themes to go with the series, one sung by Haruka Mishru's voice actors, Shibi Usa's VA sings the next, while the third is a Mamoru song, so naturally Kenji Nojima handles the lyrics to that one. Of the three, the Tuxedo Mask ending is the only one I really like, while the rest are too sappy and boring for my taste. The Episodes With the exception of the first manga chapter, which is split into two episodes, don't go into this series expecting much in the way of pacing and development. I mean, there's plot development, but it doesn't help you when the characters just remain bleh. I will give the third season a pat on the back for not trying to feel like it was rushing through everything at super speed, even if it does fail at it. The first few episodes are borderline boring at times due to how quickly events are trying to play out with little room for digestion. It feels like you are eating your appetizer, main course, and dessert all at the same time, only to then realize you have to sit at the table and wait for everyone else to finish their meal before you can leave. And then in the second half of the show, a few of the events that occur feel dragged out as if they were just stalling for time because they had to keep it one chapter per episode without spilling over into the next chapter. It's most certainly noticeable when the first three minutes of the final episode is just watching the last five minutes of the previous episode in a bridge form as a recap before the opening song emerges, leaving you with maybe 17 minutes of show left, and even that sometimes feels stalled. Nevertheless, the final two episodes are my favorite of the season because of Sailor Saturn. Getting to see her in all her badassery in anime form is just amazing as it was the biggest missed opportunity of the original anime adaptation. My favorite moment is hands down this one when she is getting ready Ready to finish off Pharaoh 90. Let me die in my home star system. So beautiful. 
the deep agony of destruction. As for my least favorite episode, you can pretty much pick any of the ones in the beginning. However, I'm going to go with Infinity 4 because of how quickly Louie and her plot are put to an end. There's like no time to really grasp anything going on as it feels like two episodes that were merged together for time reasons. It starts out where the previous one left off with Neptune using her wicked violin to knock out the Guardians, and then immediately jumps into Ami having to take some mock exams to get into the school mysterious events are happening around, which reveals Velui's plan and then it's over. Using my ingenious system, not only can I offer Master Pharaoh 90 hosts, but I can also utilize their empty shells as vessels. It's just a total waste of time while representing exactly what I described at the start of the episode section with it taking forever to do anything. Overall, while Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3 is a vast improvement over its predecessor seasons from a production standpoint, its narrative still leaves a lot to be desired. Thus, I am going to give Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3 a deserved 3 out of 5 rumps and spandex. I love the increased screen time for Sailor Saturn, and again, the animation is so much livelier. The biggest detriment once again comes down to its pacing and narrative, leaving it that this is really going to be only for Sailor Moon diehards. If you have not liked anything that has come before, you're not going to find something to enjoy now. Until next time, bye.